Okay, good. Where is it? Can you can you help me put this put this on the belt? Thank you. Yeah, it's kind of hard, I know. Thanks. Is it on now? Yes. Okay, and now you can hear me on YouTube. Uh, so we're back, uh, lecture three. We worked really, really hard in lectures one and two to lay down a lot of groundwork for getting to real experiments and taking your great theory ideas into experiments on quantum computers and devices. So in lecture two, we really focused on one particular but keystone method, probabilistic error cancellation, which somebody called magic, talked about error bars. <laughs> different from crystal's magic, um, and finally learning the noise and overcoming it. Perfect, so that was all under the hood. Now we're gonna abstract that away, call it a method and just use it. So in this lecture, we're gonna put it together, look at how we can look at simulating the Ising uh, model first, just start you know, with a very basic thing that all of you understand better than me. Look at experiments in a quantum device and try to compare classical simulations to quantum simulations. And what are the consequences for scaling up and bigger experiments? And as an example of that, I'll focus on an experiment that uh, myself and the team put out just last week, which uh, looks at uncovering integrability or local integrals of motion in both many body localized systems, which you heard about from David Hughes and many other speakers here um, in 124 qubits depth 60 circuits. So let's start with the tr simple transverse field Ising model. Uh, under some Hamiltonian that looks like this with some uh, J exchange coupling between neighboring spins and some transverse magnetic field. Let's say we want to understand what the magnetization, the global magnetization of this uh, spin chain looks like under some parameters J and H over time. So how do we do this? Well, you've touched on trotter circuits a number of times, but Let's briefly review these as we go through. Starting with the Hamiltonian, ideally what you want to do is prepare some initial state on a number of qubits. Perhaps it's 5,000 qubits, but here I'll keep it to five. You want to then apply a unitary, which is just the time propagator for some time t. Uh, I think this was touched on by Frank, but let's just walk over it for definitiveness of example here for a superconducting qubit processor whose native gates, the gates you can actually apply in a real device and experiment are only rotations around X, Z and two qubit C naught gates. So we have to take this uh, cartoon picture of a unitary here and decompose it onto gates. So I think you have seen or already know most of this, but let's be specific, you can take that unitary and expand it with the Trotter Suzuki formula into a product of unitaries of an approximation order K. That was the Trotter approximation for some finite time step delta T. Since we're talking about computers, we're going to digitize everything. So with qubits, time, everything's going to be digital. The first order Suzuki Trotter uh, unitary expansion just looks like this, where HJ is one of the terms in a Hamiltonian that's the sum of many terms. For our exact Hamiltonian here, 
the way to do this nicely is to group all of the ZZ terms together because they all commute, to group all the X terms together because they all commute, write down some HZZ, some HX, which is just the total uh, sum here and the total sum here. And then to write down the total unitary for a total time T as a product of many steps of these two alternating unitaries that have only ZZ or X interactions, where we can define the increment in time as total time T divided by the number of steps D that we want to take. If you really care about the air bounds on this approximation, I think this is at least one good reference that can get you started. Great. Questions? Okay, you're all masters at this. So what does this look like pictorially? It looks like uh, you've taken the circuit on the left here and broken it up into two pieces. And we're going to repeat them, D steps, where D will be our depth and it will also be our number of, uh, our total time. Now, that's still not good enough for being able to decompose this into the native gates on your quantum computer. In principle, you can just call a function in a software package that should do this for you. So presumably that all exists in Qiskit, Circ, and other packages, and you hopefully don't have to worry about it. But if you really want to fine tune and understand and optimize how this works, here's the example for the total uh, time evolution of the ZZ case, where you observe that each uh, pair of terms here will commute. So you can break that down into a product of two qubit rotations for based on each term here, JJ plus one, of some angle theta. This is a rotation around the poly ZZ defined in this way, just like you have single qubit rotations around some individual poly here, it's a two qubit poly. And the angle of that rotation is going to be negative two times the uh, interaction strength J times the uh, spacing of our time intervals. That's almost good enough because now we're down to a single two qubit gate. In general, you can take any two qubit gate and decompose it into three C naughts with some single qubit rotations. There's something called the vial chamber, which tells you how complicated it is to take any SU4 unitary and break it down into different gates. But here we can just use a lookup table that I found online somewhere on how to take RZZ into control X gates. And so the picture you can remember, this comes up a lot and is quite handy, is that if you want a rotation around ZZ, similar things exist for XX and YY. You take two C naughts and in between you sandwich them with a single qubit rotation of an angle theta on the target qubit. Taking that and breaking it up into pieces, we now managed to take our global unitary into a product of two qubit unitaries that are staggered in this way. Since I can do a C naught on the same, it can do two C naughts on one qubit at the same time. So I have to stagger things. And then I can take each two qubit unitary and decompose it into the most efficient thing that I'm able to do, which in this case looks like this digital decomposition. I should mention that in some experiments, you can actually implement this RZZ of theta directly uh, with, uh, without having to decompose it into C naughts. And those are some of the kind of experimental tricks that sometimes we get to use by using the underlying physics of the device. So there are even more efficient ways you could do this. The same thing applies to the X uh, unitary HX, which is uh, just the sum of individual qubit X terms. And so you can break that down into a product of single qubit rotations around the X axis on each qubit of an angle phi, where the angle phi is now given by the transverse magnetic field uh, H uh, with some a uh, factor of two because of the rotation and a DT for the increment in time. So taking that all together, what we have done so far is we've taken our spin chain, we've mapped it onto a global unitary. We've then broken that down into a bunch of simpler unitaries, which we've then broken down further into two qubit unitaries, which then broke down into the native gates that we can actually apply. So this will be the circuit that we're going to run and execute in our quantum machine. Okay, now comes the connection to probabilistic air cancellation. What do you observe about the circuit? You observe that there are layers of C naughts in parallel controlled X gates. 
And in fact, they repeat quite a bit. You see this entire circuit, this entire Hamiltonian has only two distinct layers. Highlighted here in two shades of blue and green. So layer one looks like two C naughts on the first four qubits. Layer two looks like the alternating combination of C naughts. Great. So what does that tell us? That tells us that if we want to learn the noise that our circuit will be susceptible to, we don't need to learn a thousand layers. We only need to learn two layers. And to do the inversion, to cancel the noise, we only need to know the two noise channels. Lambda one and lambda two. Great, because if we had an exponential number of them, that would be very bad. So let's make it even simpler. And instead of five qubits, I'll make it four qubits for our very first experiment before we go up in number of qubits. So here's the two layers that we're going to now run. So this is where you can take your brilliant memory from lectures one and two, stamp it onto the slide. And remember what we have covered, which is that for a particular device, we take these layers, we repeat them many, many times, we amplify the noise. That gives, gives us many decaying curves, exponentially decaying curves. Those curves encode information about the strength of the noise. From those curves, we can, from their slope, we can extract the actual description of each of these noise channels, which give us a fingerprint of the actual noise. They give us a sparse tractable representation that can tell us exactly what the noise is with very, very high precision. And in particular, the total noise strength would be characterized by these parameters gamma. If you had no noise, if everything was perfect, gamma would be one. And the bigger the noise, the bigger gamma. And in the last lecture, we spent a lot of time on talking about the, the tail bounds, the concentration measures, the errors, how many shots you need to take. All of those scale with like gamma squared. So if gamma is smaller, we get a better and better uh, sampling complexity for this problem. So these gammas are pretty small. Yes, question. I, uh, the question is, I think the question is, how different will things be if I take these, this first C-naught alone and run it versus taking the two of them together? The answer is it can be very different. Most of the time it's a little different, a tiny bit different, but it can be very different. And that really depends on the particular frequencies that each of these qubits is located at. If you remember, we talked about the energy levels shifting. And I mean, Steve did a brilliant job of showing you the spectra of you know, coupled harmonic and harmonic oscillators. And so it really depends on where those energy levels are, how much crosstalk you're going to see when you have things concurrently versus uh, not. And in, in practice here, we do see that, yes, there is a difference. How big that difference is depends on qubit to qubit. Yeah, question. Ah, how many qubits is this gamma four? Thank you. Uh, this, this four qubits. So this is just four. And I'll have a slide which shows you how gamma scales with the number of qubits. You remember that all these are, the scaling will be exponential, but weakly exponential. And by weakly, I mean that these gammas are close to one. Yeah, Matthew's asking, does this drift? The answer is yes. Okay, on what time scale? The time scale uh, that I will use in these experiments is two hours. Every two hours, we're going to rerun this protocol. This protocol too, it takes about 10 minutes. I also tried it at six hours and, you know, it still works, but I can see that the answers we get are a little bit more off. How does that scale with the number of qubits? Yeah, yeah, thank you, Emmanuel. So Emmanuel's asking, how, um, it's 10 minutes for these two layers for four qubits. How long does it take to, let's say we have 100 qubits, how long does this take? 10 minutes. So it's flat, it's constant in the number of qubits. <laughs> the, the, the comment is, it sounds a little bit weird. Yes, it should. And that's because it's magic. Uh, coming back to somebody's comment here. Uh, the reason that it scales linearly, or it basically doesn't scale, is because we have assumed uh, that the noise is 
uh, effective is local in some sense. It's sparse and local in some sense, the sense which follows the topology of the device. Because of the locality of the noise, it means that I can parallelize my learning. So I can, you know, um, if I keep adding qubits here, that doesn't, that doesn't uh, change uh, the issue, the, the whole protocol. The slightly more mathematical way to say it is that we need to prepare, learn in different poly bases for every pair of qubits. And we can take the graph of this device and color code the graph and use the coloring of the graph, which for a you know, degree two or three graph, you can always color with like sub three colors. So the coloring of the graph doesn't scale as long as you only need um, have, uh, you know, a fixed locality K. So if the locality is higher in the noise model, then this wouldn't be 10 minutes. It would be, you know, it would depend on how, what the locality is of the noise. But because we uh, designed the devices to mostly have nearest neighbor crosstalk and not have crosstalk from, you know, a qubit here all the way to a qubit on the other side of the universe, uh, that's why we can parallelize massively the learning of the noise and it only goes like the locality of the noise. Yeah, question? So it's sparse in that one of the can you next nearest neighbor errors and is it smaller? Great question. The question is, have you looked into the next nearest neighbors? It absolutely will matter at some sense, at some level, because, you know, I mean, as a former hardware designer and engineer, I know that we don't get things perfect and uh, it will matter. The, how well it matters is how well we can do this Ising simulation, because if the answer is, suck, then we haven't done a good job. But if the answer is quite good, then whatever we've taken for our approximation must, must be good enough. And the answer is it's good enough. Maybe as we push the limits, then we'll see that we need to go to, uh, to higher you know, non-local weights. But for the most part, you can ignore them in the current devices at the current levels of accuracy we care about. Okay, great. Some big picture questions here. Okay, so we've, now we've learned the noise for the two layers. We know what the gammas are. Now we've decomposed our circuit into a digital quantum circuit. As you remember, each layer here has a noise channel, lambda, that comes with it. So here's our two gates. What we want to do is to implement lambda inverse. And we also will want to, we'll also want to um, make sure that this channel that these channels are poly channels. So we're going to poly twirl all the channels and we're going to insert individual poly gates into this lambda inverse that we're, we'll sample based on the noise we learned in the previous slide. So knowing the noise, knowing P, we're going to find Q, that uh, inverse lambda decomposition. And we're going to sample a bunch of random polys based on that. And we'll add signs at the end of this and we'll add gamma and we will sum everything together. And uh, finally, because we want to study the magnetization of this, not just in the Z direction, but in X, Y, and Z, we'll measure in different bases by doing some pre-rotations on the measurements, basically single qubit gates that take Z to X or X or Z to Y. Uh, which one? Yes. Um, so if you remember in the previous lecture, we showed that, yes. So let's see, hopefully you can see here. You know, with the previous lecture for the bit flip, we showed that lambda, let's say lambda was a bit flip channel, then it would have been uh, one minus P uh, times, uh, you know, I, I rho I plus uh, P X rho X, right? And we showed that the inverse is equal to one minus Q uh, I rho I plus uh, Q X rho X. So in the previous slide, we learned what, we, we learned P, that allows us to compute Q, and that allows us to construct circuits which will either sample the identity here or with some probability will sample the X gate. That's the one qubit case. If you have the multi-qubit case, all you have to do is just write a sum instead. So you can just say that there's a sum here that now is over some coefficients that, I don't know, let's call them R, uh, no, let's call them P. It's called them PA times the polys uh, PA here, rho PA. So they're in principle four to the N of these. So it's a lot, right? 
But what our learning protocol in 10 minutes has done is learned each and every one of these P's, but it hasn't done that explicitly. It does it through some sparse representation because there are too many of them, but it describes the entire thing. And then in the second part, we can write down lambda inverse, which itself is again, just some other coefficients, eta inverse, you know, PA hat rho uh, PA. And the trick of course, is that we can efficiently compute or sample from the inverses. And not only that, we can take each of these gates and just write it as the product of a bunch of uh, single qubit poly. So for instance, X, Y, et cetera, on N qubits. So that's, that's the decomposition. That's what we've taken and done uh, for each and every one of these layers and basically multiplied everything together. Okay. Good. So how well does this do? How well are we doing here? Okay, let's take uh, the four qubit chain. Yes, question. I don't have, say that again. I don't have errors in the single qubit rotation. Ah, yes. So. I can either assume that because experimentally we can independently verify that their errors are a hundred times smaller, or there, there's a trick you can do, which I sort of mentioned at the last, at the end of lecture one, which is that suppose I have some single qubit gate. I suppose I have some single qubit gate uh, here, X, that gate X has some error, which I can call uh, Lambda X, let's say, okay. And then I have my two qubit gate. Let's call this X1. You know, maybe this is on N qubits, doesn't really matter. Then I, over here, I want to say that I have my uh, control X gate. Maybe it's between qubits one and two. Um, with that gate, we know that there's another channel, which I might call lambda CX, right? That's associated with the two qubit gate. The trick now is to say that the way the protocol works, we we can just as well lump everything into one single noise channel lambda. So the noise we're going to learn and the noise we're going to invert isn't just the noise of the individual of the two qubit gates, it's actually the total noise of the two qubit gates and the single qubit gates that precede it. So we take care of it. That's true as long as these uh, gates all have the same error and we make sure that's the case. Yeah, question? Uh, ah, yeah. Well, uh, you know, the real operation we have is some some channel X. So X is a super operator here. The tilde, the twiddle just means it's noisy, which I can write many ways. I can write it as uh, I can write it as lambda um, X. Maybe I should be explicit. So X, the super operator, that X dot X like this. I think that's okay. But I can equivalently write it as X lambda prime, right? I, I can also choose to write another lambda double prime X, you know, lambda triple prime. There are many different decompositions I'm free to choose. They're all related and equivalent so long as I uh, am consistent. And in this case, I've been mischievous and I've, uh, <laughs> I've chosen to put the noise of CX on the left, but the noise of X on the right. Great, thank you. Okay. So how well does this work? Let's take a look. So here's, let's start with just four qubits. We'll scale up in a minute. Four qubits in a chain. I want to find the ideal global magnetization vector. Here's, you know, I'm lucky. I have a computer that can simulate four qubits. So I've used that to uh, construct the ideal noise-free expectation value of the magnetization with time. For the parameters, H is one, J is minus 0.15 and uh, delta T of a quarter. So that's why you see that uh, it's a bit jagged because we have discretization in time. You see that if H was one and J was zero, if there was no two qubit interaction, you would just have a Rabi rotation between Z and Y. Basically you would have, you would just rotate in a circle. Because we have two qubit interaction, you get entanglement, the spins uh, 
entangle, and so the magnetization starts to uh, spiral in towards zero. On the right here, I'm going to plot the difference in the Euclidean norm between what we measure in the ideal and uh, in the ideal case. Okay. So the first thing I should do is show you the best error mitigation I can do without probabilistic error cancellation. So if I do dynamical decoupling, twirling, readout error mitigation, uh, et cetera, et cetera, basically everything I know how to do without correcting, without implementing lambda inverse. So this is already having all, all the tricks in the toolbox. What we see is that the data agrees initially, great, but as time goes on, the deviation between our theory and uh, the actual experiments grows linearly. So as a function of the number of trotter steps, you get a, uh, the spin magnetization is, is increasingly diverging. They, the two curves look like they're on top of each other, but notice that the red one spirals in almost to zero when it should have been over here. So the quantum computer is giving us some result. It's close, but clearly the noise, which is mostly incoherent at this point because we twirled it, is making this curve decay faster. And you can see how the red curve just spirals in quicker. That's decoherence for you. <laughs> Great question. It's so ugly and so upsetting that I'm not going to show you. <laughs> the other question was, what, what would the data look like if you didn't do any mitigation at all? If I want to talk mitigation, I want to show the data. I will see if I have it somewhere, but but uh, you know you won't sleep the same after you see it. So, <laughs> the, the the question for the audience is: How long is this in natural units of the Ising model in terms of the total time? Did anyone calculate it yet? I, I don't know. The answer is I don't know. I, I'd have to sit down and think it. I actually don't really care here because for this case, all I care about is I have some quantum evolution. I, I'm not even interested in the trotter error. I just want to see whether the noise-free case agrees with the noiseless case. Um, and do so for a problem where you know there's some entanglement and there's some time. Oh, and maybe we have... Yeah, my, my time. Yeah, thanks. So after 16 steps, it would be four. Yes. The time step is a quarter. Good. Is that a, ah, uh, you were going to say. Okay. It's, yes. Yes. Yeah, so to rescale the student's h bar over j, and I'm sorry, I don't have that up here. Um, yeah, so this 15 times one fourth, and then you have to rescale by j. Okay. So yes, question. Yeah, the question is, uh, can you remind, can I remind you of the model, which is this? Well, uh, I suppose this one. Yeah, so H is the transverse field. J is the exchange coupling between neighboring spins. Yeah, I think the question is, how does this compare to, to what we would expect given the fidelities of the IBM and Google devices? Um, okay, well, first, I guess, so mm, that's, it's, uh, yeah, maybe let me say a couple of things. One, this is number of trotter steps. So you have to take into account that there are, if I go back to this, there are four, there are four CNOTs per trotter step. So the circuit is um, 15 times four. So it's 60, right, uh, ish. So then that's getting deep, uh, deep, more or less. 
Um, and with some danger of skipping ahead here, you know, if I plotted all of the many body superconducting qubit experiments, I could try to understand what's feasible and what's possible today in terms of depth and a number scale. So we can definitely go bigger and we can definitely go deeper. Uh, and I'm also realizing that this plot is too early. So maybe you'll let me get to it when uh, I have it later in the slides. Yeah. So the short answer is, yeah, we could probably do, you know, we can push this, we can go maybe a little further, but things tend to be a little worse when you put these together. And as I mentioned, this is using C naughts. There are more efficient decompositions, which is kind of what the Google team does. For them, it's easier to do some of these because their native gates are different and they're more suited to some of the physical models. But, but that's maybe a little. Um, you need a Clifford gate or ideally. And that's because you have to poly twirl or randomize compile, you have to push the gate through. Now, even if your gate isn't Clifford, you can still poly twirl, but it's a little more complicated. But you know, for the Google devices, they have like an F sim gate or F swap gate. So it's it's the story is a little different because that gate is more efficient in the model you want to study. Okay, great. Okay. Um, so how does it look like if you now do this probabilistic error cancellation, which you guys spent three hours learning? So here's the data. Um, so this is now uh, the ideal curve is dashed. The actual data uh, is shown in the blue dots. And this is with relearning the noise every two hours. You can uh, now see that you know the data and experiment, the theory and experiment now agree much, much better. And in fact, we can see that the error is pretty low. Now you might say it's kind, it's not quite flat, it's slowly growing. And that's because the if you remember the number of shots I need to take for deeper and deeper circuits goes like gamma squared. And so I'm taking more and more shots and I've been lazy not to overdo the number of shots and make sure that you know it scales so that I would have a flat error bar because it's easier to uh, not have to suck up the system for everyone else for too long. Yes, question. So what the whole thing is based on, if I get that right, is the systematic offset. Because otherwise, if you do the probabilistic error cancellation, what you're just getting is the depolarizing channel, which probably just gives a decay of your system. So what I don't get is, is where the systematic error is coming from. Or talking in your picture, you talked about the drunk guy who's always too depolarized. Why does the error here drift at all? Because for a large circuit with a huge amount of random noise, I would have thought that the drunken guy just widened and did not have the system at the yeah, I think I think the question is if I understand it right, why is there still some why why could there be a bias? Uh, especially when you have a large circuit very deep with many qubits, why do why don't things just average out? And, and that's because all the noise is biased. Uh, so you know, even if everything's random, well, there are two ways to think of it. One is think of it as a random stochastic process. But for this question, it's easier to just think of the average evolution, right? It's just some CPTP map. That CPTP map is not a depolarizing channel. It's neither local depolarizing and it's not a global depolarizing channel. And so what it's going to do is shrink all the block vector components in different ways at different strengths with different directions. That will then get mixed by the two qubit unitaries and will create some you know, effective noise channel that's much more complicated. Now, there are papers which look at the convergence of the global, of the total noise channel on the entire circuit Basically, if you push through all the noise to the end and ask what is the what does that channel look like if I have a circuit that's you know scrambling or a circuit that has many unitaries? And the answer is that it does converge, tend to converge in some log depth or something like that. I forget the exact scaling, to something that is local depolarizing like. But it depends on the model, it depends on the circuit. So there are these can be there are these kind of scrambling effects of your system on the noise, and they will tend to make it have some structure that it didn't have. But understanding what that structure is is very tricky and is only approximate. Okay, great, great. Okay. 
Um, so this is what I mean by saying this is my analogy to a noise canceling headset in quantum. We've injected more noise to, uh, on average, cancel the bias and the noise uh, in order to find uh, basically noise-free evolution. The reason that both curves spiral in, including the ideal result, is because you, J is non-zero, and so... Yes, yes. Yes, yes. Yes, so this, exactly. So the, the, the comment is, you know, why, why does the magnetization just first go to zero? It's because, it, you know, the uh, information is going into higher weight polys. That's maybe part one. Uh, you know, looking at that, you're looking at that, you're looking at that single the average, the average over all the single qubits. Okay. Yeah, sorry, maybe I didn't explain this. So N here is the qubit number. The this means the average, the expect, the quantum expectation value of the x poly operator qubit n, and this means the expectation value of a single qubit poly operator y on qubit y, and so and so on. So it's it's the average global magnetization. Maybe maybe uh, yes, it's not the total, it's not the it's not the quantum operator of the global magnetization, which is which is a different thing. Maybe I wasn't very clear. Yeah, you're not looking at the, the total sum, and then if you want to. Yeah, it's 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 this quantity, not not the one you're thinking of. That's right. That's right. Thank you. Thank you for the clarification. Okay. Great. Um, so this tells us we can do four qubits, but you know I can do that on my classical laptop. Let's go a little bit bigger. So now this is ten qubits. Now the single qubit polys are nice, but as you probably know, noise uh, compounds when you look at higher and higher weight polys. So let's look at the highest weight poly here, which is normally the hardest thing to measure and get. And that's the Z, 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 Z. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, here is, you know, air mitigation without PC as a weight 10 observable. The ideal curve has these revivals, uh, which you see here as, as the dashed line. And you notice by the time we get to six trotter steps, uh, if basically all the signal has gone away it, it, without uh, PEC. And you can do this for nine weight, nine observables, and so on. Uh, and here's what it looks like when you actually bring in this error mitigation strategy we labored to understand. Uh, so here's PEC now for uh, these 10 qubits, and you can see that it captures the revivals quite well, and the residuals, which are down here, that's the difference between, in this case, the red curve and this dashed line, or here the blue curve and this dashed line, are shown at the bottom. And so we recovered the right value. That's what we mean by an unbiased estimator. Yeah. Um, like uh, weight 10 without PC, um, did you rescale the data there also to um, factor in the decay over time? So the depolarizing? No, there's no rescaling of the data here. But, okay. Isn't that then the error comparison to see what happens if you just uh, with your and then rescale yeah the the question is why can't I just divide by an exponential curve that somehow I know what the right value is the answer is yeah the answer is that tends to work pretty well for systems like the quantinium system or some of the some of the atomic systems it doesn't work usually too well for the superconducting systems unless you condition things well because in the superconducting systems you know each qubit has a different noise strength um so each one oscillates differently yes i mean here you have some oscillations but each you know each individual spin has a different oscillation it, the the rate can can vary. So how how do I certify that the answer I get at the end of the day by doing this absolutely you know uh, heuristic thing is actually the right answer? I don't have a guarantee. What I should emphasize here is that the error bar on this value is guaranteed by that uh, chernoff hofting inequality that we derived earlier. So I know for M shots, I can know that I have the unbiased estimator with an error bar of like, you know, 2% or something. So this comes certified with, uh, with a little, you know, gold stamp and, and all of that. <laughs> yeah. But the, the certification is anyway, assuming you correctly learn the noise. 
The certification is assuming you've learned the noise. You can extend that to say, what happens if I have an error bar on the noise? But you know, if I go back to the, so these are great questions, by the way. Thank you guys. Uh, keep them coming. If I go back to the to the learning of the noise, you know, the error bars are really small. So if I want to, uh, if I, you know, they're they're not the limiting mechanism. Yeah. Yep. Is there a reason why? Oh, sorry. Too far. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. So why is there only one curve here and why are there many curves here? That's because um, there's only one weight 10 observable that's in the Z basis, right? It's only Z. <laughs> Z, 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 Z. Uh, weight nine, you can have Z, you can have I, Z, 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 or you can have Z, I, Z, 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 or, you know, basically you can do, right? So there are, there are 10 of them here, right? And then it's, it's, yeah, you understand? Good, good. Uh, yeah, question? Certification. Oh, good question. Yeah. <laughs> the question. Yes, yes. The question is, okay, you've, you've got this sparse construction. Uh, in principle, you've neglected some things. How do I know I can trust that? Well, the answer really is that you verify it in the experiment, right? You have to verify it again and again under different settings. And so this, this is one verification of that because we can do the simulation, we can check it. You can do, uh, you can do that for different you know, contexts and settings. But yes, there is, there is also an assumption there. But you know anything we always say is certified or verified is based on some assumptions. The idea is that they should be mild enough or general enough or weak enough that that we feel confident that these things are true. Okay, maybe one last question, and then I'll have to press. Yes, the question is how many shots am I taking? Um, I don't have the number here, but it's. It's something like 200 times gamma squared, gamma one times gamma two to the power of the trotters, to the power of the number of trotter steps times four, because there are four C knots per trotter step, uh, two, because there's two times the two layers. So <laughs> I don't know what that number is exactly, but uh, in the second experiment I'll show you, I'll tell you exactly how many shots it is. So in that case, it will be half a billion shots. Uh, but here it's it's a lot less. Uh, but that's okay. So we can do half a billion shots in 80 hours. Um, but that's for a much bigger experiment. The yeah, so here the drift time is two hours. So I I relearn the noise every two hours. Yeah, I relearn the noise, but the rest of the experiment goes on. I just run more and more instances of the circuit. Okay, uh, I should push forward or we'll never finish this lecture, <laughs> but I love all the questions. Uh, so I was told that only computer scientists care about scaling and error budget. So we're gonna do this one fast unless you guys really want to know about scaling. Um, this is 50 qubits, okay? Basically you can do PC even at 50 qubits. Here's a weight 50 observable uh, without PC, but with all the other stuff, this weight 50 observable is basically zero. When you do PC, you can recover it with uh, high accuracy. Uh, so how do we go to 100 qubits and beyond? Well, we derived our chernoff hofting inequalities of how accurate, how many shots it would take or how many certain instances it would take as a function of the probability P of an error. So suppose I have a fidelity of my two qubit gates over here, of say something like 10 to the minus uh, three or a few 10 to the minus four the vision looking outward from these kind of estimates is that if I want to do a hundred qubit circuit depth 400 and I have a gate fidelity of you know a few 10 to the minus four which we're getting close to showing then at a rate of about one kilohertz of shots and actually the experiments are more like run at two kilohertz so this is even an underestimate it would take you about 24 hours to to get um, I think it's a one percent error on on all of your observables so the idea is that we can trade, uh, we can trade off uh, 
accuracy and, and fidelity for runtime. So if we're willing to use the machine for longer, if we're willing to uh, you know, take one day for our computation, then we can do a, a pretty large circuit of 400 qubits uh, in, uh, in just one day if we get to the error rates. What's also very nice to notice is that you know, even a small change in the error here is an exponential number uh, of, uh, of circuits less or more. So if I move the error just by a factor of two from you know, four to two, I can save uh, three orders of magnitude in the runtime or number of shots. This is why hardware people get really excited about this because if they can make things you know, epsilon better, it can lead to a, a very large saving. Where, oh yeah, good question. Where are we right now? Mm, okay, uh, let's flash this side then. Oops. Okay, so here's a 27 qubit device. Here are the gate errors that you tend to see for these are devices online. And if I go to higher and higher uh, number of qubits in larger devices, so here's 65 qubits, 127 qubits, you can see that the two qubit gate errors uh, first of all, importantly, they haven't gone up because you know if, if if you have a dinner party with two people, it's easy to organize. If you have a dinner party with 127 people, it's a lot harder to get it right. And so this dinner party is much harder, but you know it manages to keep the same kind of error rates down. So these ones are, and I, I uh, and this actually might be the yeah. So well, what I'm realizing is oh, this is in percent. Okay, that's 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 what it is. So that's percent. I was like, something's off here. So this is not uh, this is this is not uh, ten percent error. This is uh, well, sorry, that one is ten percent error, but this is not uh, ten. It's not an error of ten. It's an error of point one. So that's in percent. So we're we're at the level of uh, you know ten to the minus two, pushing into ten to the minus three on some of the newer generation large scale devices. What I haven't shown you is that some of the newer, smaller devices are even better than this and have higher fidelities and lifetimes. Um, and so, you know, we're, we're able to seemingly push both scale and keep the quality good or maybe push it a little further down as well. So kind of at this, at this level. Great. Yeah, so the question is back to this slide here. Yep. You have to speak up a little bit, Manu. The error, uh, no, here it's not percent, here it's absolute value. So it's, this means 0.1%. Yes, there, it's bigger. It's it's off the it's uh, yeah it's somewhere at the edge of this that's right that's because I'm, I'm, this is looking outward this is looking forward so we're not here uh, so you're right right the message is we're not here today right the message is we're not here today this is uh, the path to actually running more interesting circuits on a hundred plus qubits in the next three to five years let's say right so this is looking forwards and outwards on a few years. And the main thing is that if you now write down the actual runtime, and by the way, I should mention that curve, that's a worst case error. What people have found out since is that, you know, if you take into fact uh, light cones, for instance, then you can reduce that overhead tremendously. If you take into account, you know, butterfly velocity, like all this other kinds of stuff, you can just get better and better and better and reduce that overhead. That's sort of the worst case uh, overhead that you see. And it, it depends on three things. It depends on... Uh, the speed at which you can run circuits. So that's two kilohertz, let's say, for superconducting circuits. You know, other platforms tend to not be as fast usually. So there you have to, but then they might have better quality. So you have to take that into account because the second thing they depend on is the quality. Instead of writing the gamma for the entire layer, I can write down the gamma per qubit by taking the square root of N of it. So I can write a sort of, you know, quality per qubit. And finally, the scale, how many, What's the depth and number of qubits? So that would be your runtime of the algorithm. Yeah. Which one? Oh, you mean the one with the uh, with the with the fidelities? Yes, great, great. Uh, this one.
Ah, the question is, why isn't this smooth? Why are there some outliers? And that's because experimentalists are only victims of the gods of misfortune. <laughs> so uh, these are outliers. You know, there's when you make uh, 127 qubits, every once in a while, one or two of them could be bad. And the idea is that, you know, as time goes on, you have less and less of these. But right now, the way the technology works is that you tend to have one or two bad uh, bad dinner guests and you usually can just ignore them or if you can't then you have to take that penalty the thing is that most experiments that most people run tend to be smaller than the 127 so you can just avoid them but if you actually want to use the full device as i'll show you in the next experiment then then you really need that uh in there uh could you speak up Yes, yeah, so yeah, so what causes those errors is it's well understood. You know, it's collisions, frequency collisions. Usually it can be also uh, materials defects, but usually it's not those things. Usually frequency collisions um, and two level system defects in the solid state material. Um, I would take more questions, but there's no way we're gonna make it through the second half of this talk, so. <laughs> of this lecture. So let me maybe uh, press forward to say, okay, so these are the actual gammas today. They're, they're pretty small, you know, 1.01 .01 is some of the best. So the idea is that you can use this weekly exponential scaling to try to write a bridge between where we are today and where quantum error correction will ultimately kick in. There might be, pro there could be problems, right? Whose classical runtime is exponential or very, very hard. Ideally, a quantum computer could be able to solve those problems. Let's say it has good scaling, but you need fault tolerance, you need error correction for that, and we just don't have that yet. Um, so what the hope right now is, is that we can use these kinds of techniques who, which have poor scaling, but maybe practical enough uh, at, with the devices that get better and better, to go into a regime where you perhaps you can't do the problem on a classical computer, but you can do it on a quantum computer. Sort of a first, a first, uh, a first step towards this direction, which I think many of you have already either had a paper on or talked about or tweeted about, and uh, and and of course our one of the authors I should acknowledge is somewhere in this room, um, came out recently, and you know this was a paper where. Uh, we now can do a quantum calculation of, again, it's an Ising model uh, that has, that is hard to verify classically because there are many different methods that have been used to simulate the same calculation on this depth 60, 127 qubit circuit, but none of them seem to agree as of the moment. Hopefully people will sort this out soon, but you know, maybe it's becoming a little bit harder to just run it on my laptop. Good. Pardon? So uh, given my solution, I can verify it. Well, if I do this, this circuit is, you know, quite large, deep and complicated and very entangled and the observables are high weight. So this one is hard to verify on, on my classical computer. Uh, Oh, no, this is time dynamics. This is time dynamics. This is not ground state. Right. I should have mentioned that. It's, it's very similar to the model we just looked at. Basically a bigger version of that. And it's based on two techniques, PEC, which we covered, and also the ZNE method. It's combining the two. Okay, that's all I'll say about that. So what's the message when, when you have, when you do your theory and you think about what experiments might connect to it, you know, you can do them numerically. What can you what can you do in terms of uh, quantum computers or have your experimental colleagues do? I'll let Emmanuel and, and the rest of the lecturers speak about other systems. I'll mention superconducting uh, qubit-based uh, quantum computers as opposed to cat-based quantum computers as we heard uh, from, from Steve. Uh, but it really comes down to just two things, how many qubits and what's the depth? 
that's basically whatever you do, it fits onto this simple plot. And I've tried to take a few, you know, visible experiments uh, over the years here and plot them in this curve. You notice that most of them are under 20, 30 qubits. They can go deeper. You notice there are a couple that are more qubits, but they're shallow. And that's because it's easy to go deep. It's easy to go, it's easier to go big, but it's very hard to go big and deep, right? So it gets harder and harder. So the experiment I'll, I'll hopefully have time to tell you about uh, in, in the next, uh, oh, wow. <laughs> in the next uh, 30 minutes, I think, right? Yes, in the next 30 minutes is going to be this one. Okay, so I'll apologize because this will really be more of, of a big picture preview than we'll have the time to go into too many of your questions. Uh, but hopefully it gives you, my, my intention with this is to give you a flavor of what kind of things are possible today. And to give you a sense of how we do them. So uh, this is, this we actually just, this came out, I think last week on the archive. And I should acknowledge because somebody asked me that uh, two of the key members of this team were interns who were there only for three months and, and did, you know, a little bit more work afterwards, but, um, you know, it was really valuable work and great uh, effort done by, by two of our interns. And of course, by Oles who kicked this project off. Many body physics systems are interesting, fundamental, technological, and generally difficult to simulate. Uh, one way to try to reduce the complexity is by thinking, by finding symmetries, conservation laws, or perhaps if you can, integrability in these systems. But that's generically hard to do. You've heard about integrals of motion, which are uh, operators, L, that commute with the Hamiltonian or, and the time propagator, U. And the expectation value of these integrals of motion is a constant, right? It's a conserved quantity. So this is going to be a bit of a refresher. So you might have some spin lattice system subject to some Hamiltonian and unitary. You can take an integral of motion and decompose it into a bunch of polys. And let's say that I want to come back to our favorite model, which has only Z terms, because I, I can somewhat understand what it does. What are the integrals of motion? Well, this one's pretty easy to find, right? Uh, the Z, Z operator on qubit zero is an integral motion, the Z operator on qubit one, two, three, four, and so on and so on. So in this case, there are n integrals of motion, um, Z, which are just the Z operators. And you can use them if you want in this case, because it's a complete set to label all the eigenstates of the entire system. Right, uh, and of course you have to make sure that your integrals of motion are orthogonal, uh, complete, and perhaps have the right eigenvalues. Yes. Yes, thank you. So the, the, the comment is these, these are not unique integrals of motion. I could have chosen a difference that they could have been, uh, you know, basically the sum of any uh, two of these is another one. You could, you know, multiply them together. So there, there are many different, they're not unique, basically. I think that's maybe the comment. Okay, good. Um, what about local integrals of motion? So a local integral of motion just means that the support of that operator is bounded in some sense. It's localized. So here I have, uh, say, the kth integral of motion. I can decompose it into polys labeled by the index mu. And let's say that these mu's are only appreciably non-zero in the neighborhood of the site k. So this is what I mean by a local integral of motion. Now, of course, there are caveats here about exponential tails. And you heard about it. I think David talked about, you know, the exponential tails and what that means for MBL and things like that. And, and there, are, there are definitely subtleties that one should be worried about. But generally, even this uh, notion here is it can be hard to find these to understand what they are. It's, you know, it's beyond finding ground states. And... Uh, what we will be interested in is the dynamics here. Okay, good. So yes, you heard about this from David. Uh, you saw uh, earlier lectures and how, I don't, I don't actually think he talked about how they connect to MBL, uh, but we'll just introduce this briefly. Uh, we're, I'm really happy that we have Emmanuel here who with some with the colleagues has a uh, very nice review if you want to 
dive a little bit deeper into thermalization entanglement and many body localization. Uh, the basic idea is that presumably, purportedly, right, there are two regimes, maybe potentially, possibly phases. Um, and the hypothesis is that the Hamiltonian of the model that you have at hand can be decomposed or rewritten in terms of locally conserved quantities or local integrals of motion, which form this kind of diagonal Hamiltonian in the right basis with the right encoding, where these uh, epsilons, uh, epsilon here would be the dominant term, and then each higher order coupling would decay uh, and be bounded. Okay. So many, this is of course interesting, but potentially it violates and breaks their goodicity. MBL systems are purported to have an extensive local uh, set, of set of local integrals of motion. Even if there isn't MBL, you can still talk about approximate or quasi or pre-thermal uh, local integrals of motion for these systems, which I can define in the sense that the commutator is approximately zero or perhaps on finite time scales or some short time scale, it looks like it's uh, zero. But if you went for exponentially long times, that scale with the size of the universe, then maybe it's not zero. Okay. So in this part of the story, what we want to do is to actually find each and every, find a complete set of local integrals of motion in a many body system. And we'll do that both in 1D, which is much easier to understand numerically on a classical computer and in 2D where I can have a light cone that touches every qubit. I should, I want to acknowledge that there's a, a tremendous amount of work on experiments related to these kinds of systems and, you know, many from people in this audience. Uh, so sorry if, if, I, if I missed your name or the font is too small, I apologize. Uh, so coming back to the question we have here is, I, I think the question for me at least is, can we use a quantum computer to even answer this question? Or is it too noisy? Is it too hard? Um, and can we do so at some scale of the order of 100 qubits? Okay, so here's a quick preview before we dive into the details. Suppose I have this uh, large lattice and I'm going to take it and embed it into my uh, quantum chip and device. We actually use almost all the qubits on this device. By the way, this picture is showing the noise model, if you remember from the PEC learning uh, in, the last, uh, in the last lecture, except now I can also do it at 127 qubits. The setting of the experiment to give you a sense of what's state of the art today is 124 qubits. It's a 2D heavy hex topology. So it's, it's a honeycomb lattice with uh, extra nodes on the, on the edges. We'll go to 60, depth 60 C naughts. There's about 20 Floquet steps. We'll use Floquet unitaries rather than Hamiltonians here to avoid Trotter error. And uh, that's about 2,600 C naughts. I think somebody had asked me how many shots. Uh, so there, the number of circuits will run is, is about a third of a million circuits. Uh, it's about half a billion shots. And it's about 80 hours of QPU runtime. Okay. Good. Any questions so far? Okay. So here's, uh, here's the interaction map of the device. If you remember our first uh, few slides today, we showed how to take a big unitary and break it down into uh, individual layers. And so here there'll be three layers. Uh, this is color coding the edges. Does, actually, we don't really need to talk about it. The idea is that you can encode different initial states. Suppose I take these spins and I prepare a pattern where everything is in the ground state over here and everything is excited in the blue dots. Uh, because we have sponsors, we picked a, a very specific logo to encode as the initial state. And, um, and then you can just run the dynamics, error mitigate it and see what happens. Uh, because I can't do the calculations for these kinds of things. So here's what happens. So in one regime, which I'll call the thermalizing regime, and I'll introduce a little more concretely in a minute, you see that at Step zero, you see a nice well-defined picture. At step one, that picture is basically gone. And then you, know, you see heat death, let's call it. You just see that information scrambled into high weight polys. All the local observables are effectively gone. On the other hand, in this other parameter regime of this model, we see that the logo diffuses a little bit, but it doesn't fully disappear. 
something is happening. It's not clear yet, is this thermalization? Is this something else? Perhaps there are local integrals of motion here, which are conserving the information and simply locally re-encoding it. So that's what we like to understand. Okay, now let's actually specify what this model is. So I have a bunch of spins over some disorder. I will define the evolution of this system. It's a bit of a new model, but basically it's a Keck-Ising model, where at each time step, I'll apply a unitary called UF, called the Fluquet unitary. I'll take that many times and finally measure. Okay, so what is this unitary UF? In this case, this unitary will look a lot like the thing you saw earlier uh, in the PC Ising experiment, where there was two qubit gates. In this case, they're control Z gates instead of CX gates, but they're, they're just related by single qubit Hadamards. Then I have single qubit gates called theta, which are rotations around Z and X of some angle. And jointly, the CZ plus this theta, that's going to define the kinetic term and the interactions in our Hamiltonian. So notice that if theta is zero, this uh, entire model is integrable and is, uh, is everything is a z-term basically because the disorder gates, which will be spatial disorder. So we have uh, the same phi at each step, but different for each wire. These phi's are just phase gates. So if theta is zero, everything is based in z and you know it's a simple system. But as soon as theta is non-zero, we start to get interactions between the qubits. Okay, now the, I think what you have covered in earlier lectures is that suppose uh, we start with an operator or some excitation on this side here. There can be potentially two different regimes. In one regime, the information would spread out very quickly, uh, do, uh, bounded by some cone. You know, you talked about Lee Robinson and so on. And I, let, I can call that the ergodic regime. But in another part of the regime, that might depend on the strength of the interaction relative to the size of the disorder, which here we're going to say uh, is going to go from minus pi to plus pi always. That's the, this phi gate, that's this random phases. Uh, maybe in that regime, the information is bounded or just spreads much slower depending on what happens. And ideally we'd like to see if within this regime, there could be this local integral of motion, which we can decompose into polys of different sizes and weights. Okay, how do we actually do this? The way to do this is, you know, you take your circuits, you, the, the ones we showed right here, this unitary, that's the bare circuit. You then feed it into an error mitigation factory. Uh, I like this example because we covered PEC. This one is going to use Z and E because it was just easier to do for this case. And we didn't yet have this new method that just came out in this, in this nature paper. So this one will use, uh, we basically create again, many, many versions of the circuit. We twirl everything to make the noise incoherent where there's idle periods, we use dynamical decoupling. And then we additionally add some uh, error mitigation for the readout. All of that goes into a quantum machine, which at the end of the day, just gives you a dictionary of zeros and ones with some probably with some counts. So, you know, if you ran a thousand shots, maybe you saw 20 zero zero zeros, 480 zero zero ones, and so on and so on. Afterwards, we take all that data and we post-process it, just like we did here in order to find uh, lambda inverse, we do the same kind of similar idea of post-processing in order to find the time evolution of many polys. Good. The first thing that you probably want to see is just some kind of benchmark. And uh, because we don't have a whole lot of time, I, I won't show you every benchmark out there. So, like we reconstructed one particle density matrices and things like that, but uh, I'll keep it short and just show you some of the things that are possible. You can take this 1D spin chain and let's say we encode it like this. You notice that I left out a few qubits and that goes to your question in the back, which is that there were those outliers. And here there's a really bad qubit somewhere at the top of this chain. So that's why we didn't include it. And uh, taking this snake, we can prepare some initial state. Let's prepare an antiferromagnetic state where half the qubits are zero, half the qubits are prepared in one. We then time evolve it. 
under two different regimes. In one regime, we'll take the interaction strength to be uh, greater than 0.16 pi. Okay, why 0.16 pi? Now you have to believe me that you, you can numerically verify even with classical methods that there is ergodic behavior in this regime. Whereas if you look at you know, Poissonian level statistics and, and basically do all the standard measures of MBL, there seems to be an MBL phase in 1D numerically for theta smaller than 0.16. So let's say that that's true. Let's just run the dynamics on a quantum computer and what's, see what happens in the two different cases. In one case, when theta is high and presumably you're ergodic, you have uh, here, I've zoomed in on, I, I don't want to show you 100 spins because that's just too much data. Let's just zoom in on 10 spins in the middle of the chain. You notice initially they start all in the one state and as time goes, or half of them start in the one state and as time goes on, the pattern basically is lost. The memory of the initial state is gone. On the other hand, the memory of the initial state in the MBL regime here for this smaller angle theta uh, is, is much higher, right? You can see that the pattern hasn't yet vanished. To make that more quantitative, you can now take uh, the two regimes and you can define something called the spin imbalance, some, basically the charge imbalance, you can say, how many of the spins remained up versus down. Ideally, if no dynamics was happening, this would be always one. But as you go to deeper and deeper number of cycles in the time evolution, you'll see that uh, in the ergodic regime, you lose the memory of the initial state very quickly. And in the other regime, the data is a little harder to see, but if you fit this, it plateaus. Yeah, question. Yes. Yes, so uh, Ah, the question is how did we find this 0.16? Yeah. So, um let me give you a short answer because the the long answer will will take too much time, but the short answer is you can begin to look at you look at many different things. So, one, you do full diagonalization for small system sizes and you do scaling with system size and you look at you look for a crossover from one regime to the other uh, that should be system size independent. And hopefully all those curves of the two regimes uh, all give you 0.16. Then you do the same thing with entanglement entropy and you look that the entanglement entropy is different in two regimes and the crossover is 0.16. Then you do it with the one particle density matrix and it gives you the same data. So we did that classically with the classical computers. Additionally, we did the one particle density matrix spectrum with the quantum device, and we did scaling with system size, and you can see a crossover of the discontinuity in the OPDM um, to, to which, you know, 0.16. So I would love to show you the data, but it's a little technical and, uh, and maybe for, okay, it looks like you're nodding, so great. <laughs> yes. Why not pick even smaller theta? Um, well, if I pick theta zero, then uh, <laughs> 0 0.05. Um, good question. I, well, I suppose, you know, you could pick different thetas and I have a plot where we vary theta, but we wanted something where, you know, if you still have quite a bit of interaction, you know, things are happening at some rate. So you can talk about in the absence of disorder, how fast would the information propagate? Ideally, that shouldn't be very slow because then it's, it, you know, it's kind of not a, as interesting of a regime. Um, that's maybe one of the main reasons. Because we're limited in the depth, we want to pick something where you would normally have plenty of propagation of information. Yeah, maybe one or two questions here. Yeah. Yes, uh, this one, I think this one is a single disorder. This one is a hundred disorders. Uh, the question is, should we look at the fluctuations? We, 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 um, we ha there is, yes, you, you could look at that too. Uh, there is, um, I don't have the plot here, but there is a plot for the one particle density matrix, which has histograms over the different disorder realizations. So there you can see the fluctuations. 
Yes, and maybe one last question here. Um, in the top curve, how much better is this exponential fit than just a linear fit with a shallow slope? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm a little concerned about that one too. The question is, okay, what if I just did a, a flat line fit here? Um, well, I think, you know, it's hard to say, but you can see that it's easier to see in the data here that the behavior is very different. Uh, you could ask, why is it flat? I think for that, unfortunately, as you know, the data is noisy. For that, you have to look at the different regimes, um, one, and two, you have to compare it with the other measurements, like the one particle. So, so you write, this is not very convincing. I would not use this to say this is MBL or not, right? I, absolutely not. This is a very, in my mind, this is a very weak signature. There, there are many models that are integrable that will give you the exact same thing that have no MBL, they, you know, like this in of itself is not a signature. It's only a signature. It's not a, a proof of by any means. That's why we do this one particle density matrix and scaling with system size, which uh, is in the paper. <laughs> Good. Um, so that's just a first benchmark. I'll skip the second one because we really want to uh, get here in the last, you know, 15 minutes to to the slightly more interesting piece for me, which is actually uncovering these local integrals of motion in the system. I'll just try to illust illustrate the basic idea. I have a spin chain. I can measure some observable, right? It evolves as a function of time. I can measure more observables. They can be low weight, high weight, whatever. And I can measure many, many, many of them as a function of time. What if I can find that by combining four of them, the sum of these four observables as a function of time is a flat line. That starts to look like a conserved quantity. Of course, this is all finite time. So, you know, who knows what happens at exponentially long times, but at least on this finite time, finite size, I can, I can see something that starts to look approximately like a conserved quantity. In order to begin to be more convinced in this, you, we can also try to do this with different initial states and try to see that these operators always give you a constant. Um, I'm going to skip this part, but this is the how we actually go through and find the integrals of motion. You know, there's a procedure. Um, there's a there's a very nice paper here that this whole idea is based on. And uh, at the end of the day, it just boils down to measuring a number of Pauli terms as a function of time in, in different initial states. So maybe I prepare an XXX, YYY, ZZZ, or XY, XY, ZZ. And then we measure the time evolution with their mitigation of a number of these poly terms. Then through some optimization and uh, tweaking, you can find combinations, linear combinations, observables that are going to yield you an approximately flat value. So for instance, this blue, blue dots here, they're just a sum of the orange curves in some non-trivial way. So even though the orange curve look like there's chaos, if you know the right way to look at this case, maybe chaos is a, is a tricky word to use here, but they look rather random. You can find what looks like a conserved quantity from which you can construct a local integral of motion or an approximate local integral of motion. That integral of motion is, has many, many poly terms. So for instance, in this case, for this blue curve, the on-site Z on qubit 50 was the dominant contribution for this A mu. You know, the X term here was the next one, then it was a ZZZ, then it was a ZYI, so and so on, right? Because these are operators. Yes. Yes, I think this is for each disorder. That's right. And I should mention the procedure is general. So whatever system Hamiltonian you throw at me, if such a, an observable exists, then I'll find it, right? Um, if, you if we do this for the ergodic part of the system, so this, sorry, I should mention this data is for the MBL part of the regime. If we do this for the ergodic part of the system, then the algorithm finds a blue curve that just looks, you know, it's going all over the place. It looks noisy. It does, it does, it just doesn't work well. It doesn't exist. So as long as my model has some 
approximate constant in motion at the time scale of observation, then I should be able to find it and reconstruct uh, this L operator. Excellent. Uh, how do you visualize a many body quantum operator? <laughs> this, is, this is very hard. So one way to do it is to try to plot the operator density in some way as a function of the weight of the polys involved. Um, so this is to try to give you a sense, a visual picture of what these things look like. There's 104 qubits in this 1D chain. Let me pick the local integral of motion centered on qubit 50 that we find. I can plot the total operator density. So basically no poly that has, uh, you know, that's got terms out here is contributing, but all weight one poly. So something like Z on qubit 49 or Z on qubit 50 or Z on qubit 47. Uh, those, those operators are pictured here. Then weight two polys like XX, those are pictured here, so and so on. So you notice that this operator L is bounded both uh, in space and in poly weight. And then I can do this for more sites. I can do this for site, you know, two, site 75, so and so on. And not only that, I can do it for every single site. So now I can find uh, 104 different integrals of motion for this 104 qubit chain that should, you know, if you orthogonalize them, should be orthogonal. So they should form a complete set. Because there's so many of them and they're, you know, quite densely packed, I've just plotted uh, every fourth integral of motion or Leom on a different axis here. And this is for one disorder realization. Good. Okay. So in principle, this starts to give us a more detailed portrait or picture of what's going on in the dynamics and maybe from there to reconstruct deeper. Uh, and you can, you know, break them down by weight. You could ask, okay, how accurate is this data? How good is this data? So because this is a 1D system, we can truncate the system and do some um, and, and uh, some numerics and try to approximate, say with spin size, spin chains of 10 qubits or 12 qubits, we can try to approximate what we should find. And so the data here for the different weights of the average uh, poly, so I'll just plot the average over most of these guys, is uh, shown here in with the circles. The numerics, which are again approximate numerics, are shown using the solid curves. And you notice that when we look at positions near the center of the Leom and that have more sizable contributions, we find, a, we find some decent agreement between the experiment with their mitigation and uh, the numerics for this 1D chain. So that gives me a little more confidence. Now, coming back to the question of bad qubits, that's some that, that uh, you asked in the back, most, if I define an error for each Leom, which is something like the Frobenius norm uh, normalized in some way that of the commutator of that integral of motion of the Floquet unitary, doesn't really matter. It's just some notion of an error. Zero is really good. One is really bad, right? Um, most of the Leoms have pretty low error, sort of a you know few percent level, let's call it but there are a couple of regions where you observe the errors are really, really bad. Uh, and well, I shouldn't say really, really bad. They're bad. They're not, they're not really, really bad, but they're bad. Um, and those regions are precisely because if you remember those fidelity plots of the devices, there was a couple outliers. Those outliers are precisely located at those sites. So you have to really watch out for the outliers uh, in, in your device. But if you steer away from them, then you can, get pretty good agreement. Now, in the interest of my five minutes left here, let me illustrate to you how this now scales to 2D. 1D is nice and interesting, but mostly it's a playground where we can simulate everything classically. Uh, 2D gets a little harder, you know, and we did all the same things. We studied spin imbalance, OPDMs, scaling with system size, and finally Leoms. Um, here is a map where we prepare an antiferromagnetic ordering in, uh, in, this, in the two regimes of the thermalizing and the pre-thermal case. Uh, and I think the, lab, uh, the labels are 
flipped. I'm sorry about that. The labels are flipped. <laughs> so if theta is zero, which is the blue curve, that means that there's no interaction between the qubits, then that blue curve should ideally always be one. This is known as a Clifford circuit. Um, so basically nothing should happen. And you notice that with the error mitigated value, you know, we're getting errors. It's a little bit off. It even goes above one because, you know, we're rescaling things. But we're able to get some kind of information or signal out that at least is in the ballpark of where it should be. And the other curves show you what the spin imbalance looks like as a function of theta. So I, so I, think, uh, I think the red curve is the thermalizing case here. And we can repeat the same picture we did in 1D, except now for 2D, and really look at what these uh, local integrals of motion look like. Actually, let me start with this slide. In 2D, it's more complicated. There's, there's different topologies of the Leoms because you can have uh, center, center nodes of the Leoms that have either two or three vertices that connect them. And so I can try to plot for you the average local integral of motion LK for both two vertex and three vertex. And for a given disorder, you can reconstruct all 124 uh, Leoms here as well. And just like in 1D, you can break them down by operator weight. Uh, the thing is that in 2D, the convergence of the Leoms is not as, you see that they don't seem to converge quite as well as you go to higher and higher operator weight. For instance, D3 looks bigger than D2. We also don't see the same signatures necessarily of the MBL regime and phase transition in 2D. That doesn't mean anything necessarily about MBL, but at least it's consistent with the non-existence of MBL in 2D. Yeah. Do, uh, do, do what, the KX? Ah, the question is, do they still, uh, they, they, you mean, Did you mean? The Leoms. Well, I think this right here tells you that it doesn't necessarily look exponential. Oh, <laughs> right. So the Y scale here is the operator weight. It's the average operator weight. La here, I think it's, uh, it's a good question. This might be log scale. I think this is log scale. Uh, well, this, you see D3 looks the same size or maybe even bigger. Oh, uh, so they decay with, with the spatial size. Yes, yes, with the spatial size, yes. But the, with, with the operator weight, no. Well, those are two, there's two different decays that you need to have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. Um, I mean, this is, you know, very fresh and new data. We, we were not able to do the classical simulation for this model. So we actually don't know what the right answer is. Um, Probably somebody in this room will do it by tonight, but at least me and my colleagues were unable to do it. Um, okay, um, so, I, so what does this tell us? I, to me, at least it says that you can start to use 124 qubits depth 60 circuits on quantum devices by using all of these composite error mitigation techniques to begin to look at many body dynamics in regimes that get harder and harder to understand classically. At least I can't simulate it, but again, again I'm sure you guys can. Um, we uncovered the, the picture of what these integrals of motion look like for uh, this uh, new model. And you know, there are many, many extensions that we can think about. Um, so to end the lectures here, where are we headed in the future? We looked at experiments today on uh, 127 qubits. We saw that the devices are getting better and better at that scale. There's already also another device at a larger scale, and hopefully those will get better. The devices get even more complicated. They're, you know, multi-layer chips with multi-level wiring, TSVs, vias, and so on. And uh, over time, uh, each device gets bigger and bigger uh, so far. And for now, you know, we've kept this particular heavy hex lattice. And likewise, lifetimes and two error gates come together. So my, I personally am feeling quite optimistic or, or energetic about doing more work in you know, quantum simulation, non-equilibrium quantum dynamics, using quantum devices, you know, superconducting, but also other platforms um, where I can access them. And I think with that, I always like to keep in mind and remember that if you learn, if I learn one thing per day, that will get me further. And I'll leave you with this thought from, uh, from Albert that has uh, kept me going at least along 
the path of uh, doing more and more complicated things. So thank you guys. I hope this was useful and helpful and uh, I'll take any final question. Do we have time for questions or how are we doing? Yeah. Uh, Steve. Oh, the question is, yeah, what do I mean by local integrals of motion are orthogonal? I was purposefully mischievously loose in my language. <laughs> um, that's because we the procedure finds these integrals of motion based on some initial guess. It doesn't naturally orthogonalize them. So technically these are not yet uh, orthogonal in, in whatever sense you want to pick, such as the, the group generator or, or trace, um, whichever sense you need so that you can span the space uh, of, of and describe all the eigenstates, basically. That, that would be the right metric. Um, but you, know, you can kind of see from just the distribution of how they're distributed that they, they, uh, the, the centers and the concentrations are all at different sites. Uh, so they're almost orthogonal already, but you know, if you really wanted to, you'd have to do some post-processing to guarantee that they're truly orthogonal in the right sense. Yeah, hopefully that helped answer you. Good. Yeah. This talks a lot about error mitigation on all of these are like strong numbers of right? And then lastly, if you want to know about all the error correction thing, as you get more and more qubits up there, is there a point that you start to see these things like they're having a fallen number of logical qubits on the system? And am I right that everything you saw here is just the physical mitigated noise? Absolutely. Everything you saw was physical qubits with mitigated noise, no logical qubits, no mention of logical qubits other than this plot. Um, hopefully what Steve is working on will just work tomorrow and we can get to logical qubits right away, either with bosonic states or with you know quantum uh, error correcting codes on digital platforms like, like uh, qubits. Um, you know, there's been a lot of nice work from, from our friends at Google who've shown more and more quantum error correction. There's been work from IBM as well. Uh, but you know, those systems are trying to maybe create one logical qubit that you know, is, isn't fault tolerant, doesn't have full, you know, et cetera, et cetera. It's just not there yet. Um, how quickly we get there is, is speculation, I'm hopeful. But everything we looked at today is probably around either on the left of the red curve right here or slightly on, or right around the red curve intersection. And the hope is that in the next few years, before we get to this green curve, which is way, way harder, we can, we can place ourselves increasingly in a regime where uh, we can do interesting physics. Yeah. Uh, what in particular motivated the heavy hex? Like, I don't know <laughs> the question is why heavy hex? It has nothing to do with physics. It's absolutely, uh, well, yeah, it's, no, not really. There is an error correcting code, but that was invent, but that was really designed after the heavy hex. The reason is that in the, the way that originally these devices were made, and most of them still are, if you have very high connectivity in your lattice. So for instance, if you have a square lattice, every edge, uh, every node has four uh, edges. That means that the frequency collisions I mentioned are that much more likely to occur. So to reduce the frequency collisions, you can reduce the effective uh, connectivity of the lattice on average by having a lattice that has, you know, a degree two and degree three. Uh, so that, that's the motivation. Good, yeah. Oh, good question. The question, oh, wow, that went fast. The question is, uh, here, I want, let's, uh, the question is, does the procedure for finding the Leons always give you the same Leon? The answer is that it converges, uh, it converges better and better for longer time. So I think, I believe, strictly speaking, in the infinite time limit, the procedure we we use will give you a precise Leon, and and that's covered in the paper down here, and also in the supplement of this paper. Um, but as you as you truncate time, the 
error will go like one over the depth of the circuit. So you are converging to uh, an actual Lyum. Now what happens in practice is that the longer, the deeper you go, you get penalized with more and more noise. So you don't want to go too deep either because then you get hit by the error of the noise. But if you go too shallow, you get hit by the error of the procedure. So the data I showed you is actually tweaked uh, tweaked in the sense of like we pick the optimal depth for our noise and procedure parameters, basically. Yes, yeah, exactly. Everything's finite time, finite size, and uh, and uh, it has some, that's why the strict name of everything I should say is approximate Leom or, you know, or approximate pre-thermal Leom or something like that, that, that quantifies the fact that on the time scale of observation, these are Leoms. Um, then, then you get into the question of things like Deborah's number, right, which talk about, uh, you know, the joke from, I think it's hydrodynamics or hydrofluidics, which is uh, God said that to God, a mountain is a fluid because on the time scale of God, a mountain will always flow and looks like a fluid. So there's a question of time scale. Um, and, uh, and you know, here the time scale is pretty short, right? It's 20 flow case cycles. It's not very long, uh, but it kind of gives us a first glimpse into at least some time scale. Yes. But by using what? By using tensor. Okay, wonderful. The comment is that in this very summer school, we have a poster on getting local integrals in motion using tensor networks in classical computers. So everybody should go check that out. And obviously, we should talk. Ah, yeah, great question. The question is, um, can I do this in the cloud myself or, or uh, basically, right? Um, let me go to the slide that has the experimental. So I should mention every, this entire experiment was done through the cloud, cloud interface, no, no backend access at all. So we did, I, all the other experiments you've seen, the big ones from IBM, they, they tended to use internal stuff or internal access or some feature. This is, this may be the first big one that we didn't use any of that for. Um, and where is my picture here? Okay, here we go. Okay, this this down here, M3, uh, open source online. You can pull it. If you Google M3 runtime, you'll find it. Uh, dynamical decoupling, if you Google Cascade Research, dynamical decoupling, you'll find it. Poly twirling, there's like 50 different versions of poly twirling code online. Cascade Research poly twirling or, or Cascade poly twirling, you'll find it. Prototype ZNE. If you go on GitHub and type prototype ZNE, you'll find this. So all of these are, are open source uh, packages and, and custom things. The challenge is that none of them work together. <laughs> uh, they aren't composable. So we had to do, you know, monkey patch things and make it work together. Um, you know, this experiment took 12 months to work up from the ground up to the, to the end and, you know, five, six people. So it is still a lot of effort and it's, it's still a pretty big effort. The goal is to automate these things increasingly. Now, the, there's a difference between doing something that's really pushing the state of the art of what the devices can achieve today, which is what we try to do here is really squeeze every little last bit of juice we can uh, versus the, the more standard things that Qiskit will provide just as an interface. So there's a thing called runtime. If you go, uh, if you try to submit a circuit, you, there's something called the resilience level. And resilience level zero means no error mitigation. Resilience level one, I think, means readout error mitigation. Two means readout plus something plus something. And three is even more mitigation. So these things are automated uh, at some level with some default workflow. And that will give you much better results than no error mitigation. But you know, if you fine tune things, you're always going to do a little bit better. Um, so that's why it helps to actually understand what these methods are doing. Uh, because if, if you just click the button, you'll get a result. And it might be good. It might be good enough for what you want, um, but it helps to have some sense of the scaling, how many shots do you need, how many twirls and so on. So then you can really try to get the most performance out as well. 
hopefully that helps answer it. And the idea is that I'll be out of a job soon because everything will just be a click of a button and you know all of you here can <laughs> just click the button. <laughs> Good. Any final question or excellent. Thank you guys. Thank you.